everyone! Today's video is about a true Scottish legend, Mary, Queen of Scots. And so it's very apt that today's sponsor is Highland Titles. Highland Titles are a family-run business that have been preserving Scotland's beautiful wild landscape since 2006. They offer a unique opportunity to own a real piece of the Scottish Highlands. And on top of this, you can become a laird, lord or lady of the Glen, just like me when I got my pack. Wait a minute, I'm a lady of the Glen now. I shouldn't be sat here in this old get-up. That's more like it. Fit to be part of Queen Mary's court now. Noting that Lady of the Glen isn't a real noble title, of course, but it is fun to use. Inside the pack, depending what size you choose, you could receive a digital download to show off your new piece of land, access to their app, a welcome pack that includes a gorgeous certificate with your new title, a special bookmark for dedicating a tree, a drinks coaster, and a lovely display map with the location of your land. Owning a piece of the Scottish Highlands is not only a great gift, it's one that lasts, and you could even visit it any time you want. Each plot is stunning and unique only to you. You could even make it a great couple's gift by buying two plots next to each other and become laird and lady of your very own part of the Scottish Highlands. Highland Titles truly is more than a novelty gift, though. When their business first started, it was to attempt to restore degraded farmland back to its beautiful natural state. By selling plots of land, this funds extra land purchases, which helps restore more of the highlands to preserve its flora and fauna. As more trees and hedges have been planted, more wildlife has returned, including several endangered species such as the pine martin. Red Squirrel and Osprey. Last year, Highland Titles even rescued several owls, nursed them back to health and returned them to the wild. So your plot of land is not only a fun way to call yourself Laird, Lord or Lady of the Glen, but it's your personal part of the Scottish Highlands as well. And on top of this, you're helping the planet by contributing to the conservation of the Highlands and its stunning wildlife. And best of all, if you use the link below in my description, all of my viewers will receive a 25% discount off any plot size they choose, and they start from as little as $30. Now, let's get back to the video and find out more about a real lady of the Scottish Highlands, Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, was a woman who was almost literally a queen from birth. For much of her life, she was seen as the binding contract of a friendship between Scotland and France, and for the rest, she was a problem for her religion and the threat she posed to the English throne. But it was one event that would dramatically twist the reins of power from her hands forever, and it is that event that this video looks at in detail, the murder of her second husband, Lord Darnley, and the aftermath. Mary was very unusual in that when she was born on the 8th of December 1542, her father, James V of Scotland, was already ill from either cholera or dysentery, and he died just six days after her birth, making her Queen of Scots before she was even a week old. However, she also came from a long line of child monarchs, beginning with James I of Scotland, her three times great-grandfather. Due to her young age, her childhood reign was dominated by regents, including her mother, Mary of Guise. Her mother came from the powerful Guise family who were in favour with the French monarch, Henry II, and this would have a bearing on young Mary's future. When she was around eight months old, the Treaty of Greenwich was signed between England and Scotland on the 1st of July, 1543. This included a plan by Henry VIII that England and Scotland should eventually be united in some fashion, and part of this was the agreed betrothal between Mary and Henry's son, Prince Edward. However, the truth was that Scotland's government and royal family both favoured a connection with the French, and of course, the English absolutely wanted to prevent this. Therefore, James Hamilton, Earl of Arran, who was at the time regent, moved very slowly on the marriage. When it became clear what was really happening, and Henry arrested some Scottish nobles and impounded their goods, it kicked off a series of wars that would become known as the Rough Wooing. 
It was a name that hid the true devastation and violence of the conflicts. By 1547, Scotland wanted assistance, and France promised to deliver it in exchange for Mary's betrothal to the young Dauphin, Francis. It was agreed upon, and at just five years old, young Mary set off with her own court from Dumbarton on the 7th of August 1548 for Brittany. She would spend the next 13 years of her life in France. She charmed all at the French court and was praised for being a clever and vivacious child, and as she grew older, beauty was added to that list too. As befitting a queen, Mary was taught how to play both the lute and the virginals, the two most popular instruments of the time. She knew how to read, write, and study poetry. As with her contemporary Elizabeth I, she knew many languages and was taught her native tongue of Scots alongside French, Italian, Latin, Spanish, and Greek, as well as horsemanship, falconry, dancing, sewing, and needlework. We even have a very good idea of what she looked like, both from contemporary portraits and descriptions. Mary would end up very tall for a woman of her time at 5 foot 11 inches and was considered strikingly beautiful as an adult with auburn hair, hooded hazel brown eyes, smooth skin and an elegant neck and was noted for being very eloquent. In a twist of fate, her future husband Francis would end up quite short, with a stutter. On the 4th of April 1558, Mary signed a secret agreement that if she died without having children, both the Scottish throne and her claim to the English crown would pass to France. On the 24th, just a few weeks later, she married the Dauphin at Notre Dame. In November of that year, the death of Queen Mary I of England meant that there was a shift in politics across Europe. In the eyes of many Catholics, her true heir should have been Mary through Margaret Tudor, Henry VIII's sister, but instead, her Protestant sister Elizabeth I took the throne. This would be the roots of a conflict that would end with Mary of Scots' head on a chopping block many years later. The following year, Henri II died on the 10th of July 1559 in a jousting accident, leaving his 15-year-old son Francis to become king. Mary was now Queen of France and Queen of Scots. Despite many later accounts making out Mary did not get on well with her formidable mother-in-law Catherine de' Medici, she actually did. She was a source of comfort for Catherine after Henri died, and the two women would often spend time together at prayers or dinner while Francis went out hunting. Francis was a difficult person to spend time with, as due to his general ill health, he was often violent and bad-tempered. But he wouldn't be around for long either. He got ill later in 1560 with a severe abscess in his ear. By the 5th of December, it had taken his life, along with the other ailments that he had suffered since childhood. Mary was no longer Queen of France, and her brother-in-law, Charles IX, took the throne at just 10 years old, with his mother Catherine acting as regent alongside the Guise family. Nine months later, Mary returned to Scotland, a place that must have seemed foreign to her after spending most of her life so far in France. While she was no doubt told about the complex political situation in Scotland, it was another thing to actually experience it firsthand. When she had left at five, Scotland, including its nobles, had been mostly Catholic. But by the time she returned, a strong Protestant faction also existed, led by her illegitimate half-brother, James Stuart, the Earl of Moray. As a result, Mary was viewed with suspicion by many in Scotland, and she had a similar problem to England in that her country was divided into Catholics and Protestants. But unlike Mary I of England or Elizabeth I, she did not implement a standard religion for Scotland, and instead tolerated both factions existing. This angered both sides, and the Catholics were especially put out that she also kept her half-brother Moray as her chief advisor. It wasn't a bad move, we can see that she likely considered it would keep everyone happy if they had a Catholic queen with a Protestant advisor who was also her relative. 
Her Privy Council was also made up of 16 men who had retained their offices for a long time, and many of them, again, were Protestant. And worse than this, many of them had been leaders during the Protestant Reformation crisis of 1559-60. Some historians consider this was Mary admitting she couldn't face another Protestant uprising militarily on her own, and that she may have been focused on the English throne over the internal problems of Scotland. She would have found Scotland a very different prospect to France. The country as a whole was poorer, including the nobles, and there was constant infighting amongst them. This infighting was a result of clan arguing and several generations of marriage between clans, and the separate areas under the control of each noble was treated almost as a separate principality. As a result, they did not appreciate the monarch taking too keen an interest and wanted to be able to rule their areas without interference. Either way, as a young queen without heirs, Mary had to consider remarrying. While still in France, she had considered marrying Carlos, Prince of Asturias, the eldest son and heir of Philip II. But her ex-mother-in-law Catherine's daughter had just married the Spanish king, and Catherine didn't want her daughter overshadowed by the presence of Mary, suggesting instead she return to Scotland. But with her huge French dowry and Scottish crown, Mary was a much-wanted bride, and she had two main candidates most people considered to be serious contenders. One was Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, son of the Earl and Countess of Lennox. Through both of his parents he had claims to the English and Scottish thrones, and so a marriage to him would also strengthen Mary's claim to the English crown. The second candidate was James Hamilton, Earl of Arran, who was a strong contender but unlike Darnley, was a Protestant. Elizabeth I refused to name a successor to the English crown, and this prompted her to suggest her favourite, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. She didn't particularly want the Catholic Lennox family to get any closer to her throne, not least because Countess Lennox had made her life a misery when her sister Mary was alive. She also promised Mary that marrying Leicester would increase her chances of becoming the English Queen's heir, but the potential bridegroom had little appetite for the idea. Mary had already briefly met her half-cousin Darnley when he had travelled to France to offer condolences on behalf of his family for the death of Francis, but he had also secretly made clear his suit. But for a long time, Mary had not let go of the possibility of marrying Don Carlos, but Philip II was reluctant to agree. Part of this was that Carlos was mentally unstable, sadistic, epileptic, drooled constantly and had a speech impediment, but was set to inherit the throne of Spain and its empire. Due to his father doing a fantastic job of publicly covering all of this up, Mary thought Carlos was a strong, competent young man who would rule steadily by her side. This also brushed Elizabeth up the wrong way, as she didn't trust Mary due to her not ratifying the Treaty of Edinburgh, which recognised Elizabeth's right to rule in England and had been signed by representatives of both France and Scotland. But Mary had been in grieving for her mother at the time, who had died only a month before. However, Elizabeth and Mary also felt an affinity with one another as kinswomen and as fellow female rulers, and both made efforts to remain on friendly terms. However, Mary was increasingly frustrated with Elizabeth's over-interest in who she should marry, although Elizabeth maintained this was due to the fact she would name Mary as her heir if she chose a suitable husband. In February 1565, the Scottish Queen would meet again with Lord Darnley. On paper, he was a good match for her. He was at least six feet tall, if not a few inches taller, he was handsome and liked athletic pursuits as much as she did, was accomplished at playing instruments, was a poet, and was considered charming and friendly. However, the part that not many saw was his other side, which was spoilt petulant, selfish and immature. 
His arrogance and quick temper would win him enemies over the course of his short lifetime, as well as his sexual promiscuity, which drew him further unwanted attention. When they met, however, Mary was extremely well taken with him, and when she returned to Edinburgh, he came with her in very high regard. On top of this, having been raised at the English court, he had followed Protestant doctrine, despite his family being Catholic, and being fluid in this way regarding religion, won over some who were uncertain about him. Until March of that year, Mary had still been prepared to marry the Earl of Leicester, provided Elizabeth publicly acknowledged the Scottish Queen as her heir. However, when this was relayed back to the English monarch, she replied that if Mary married Robert Dudley, she would do everything she could to advance her cousin's position, but that she couldn't commit to naming Mary until she was married herself. Mary must have been furious at being conned in this way. By this point, Mary was also close friends with an Italian called David Rizzio. He was a courtier from Piedmont who had managed to find himself part of the musicians Mary had brought with her from France, and from there became her close confidant and private secretary. He jealously guarded access to the Queen, and was disliked by most of the lords at court for this reason, as well as the fact he was Catholic. Rizzio saw that he would be able to win over some favour if he made friends with Lord Darnley, and encouraged the match with Mary. Darnley had already been knocked back once for proposing too soon, but he fell ill in April, and Mary spent the night by his bedside nursing him back to health. This was scandalous behaviour for an unmarried queen, and it became clear she was infatuated with him shortly after. On the 29th of July 1565, despite the fact they had no dispensation from the Pope, Mary and Henry Stuart were married at Holyrood Palace, although she felt safe knowing that Catherine de' Medici and her son Charles IX apparently approved of the match. Almost immediately, rebellion broke out in response to Darnley becoming King Consort. The Protestant nobility were horrified at the marriage, and the Earl of Moray led the charge, taking up arms against his half-sister with many of the other lords. Others were worried the marriage indicated there would be a change in the country's religion to Catholicism, despite Mary publicly having to make an announcement to the contrary. The rebellion came to be known as the Chase About Raid, but it was soon put down by the royal forces, and Moray was forced to escape to England. It was obvious that the raid had been partly to depose of Mary, and was considered treason of the highest order. Part of the boost to Mary's forces was brought by James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell, who had returned from exile in France, and he would have a big impact in Mary's life yet to come. During her chase around Scotland without ever actually making contact with Moray's forces, Mary's enemies had of course taken the opportunity to besmirch her name as much as possible. The Earl of Bedford, eager to have Elizabeth's help in aiding Moray, had hinted that Rizzio was having an affair with the Scottish Queen. Whereas Darnley had previously been friends with Rizzio, this slowly began to turn into jealousy, even if the rumours were just that. This wasn't helped by the fact that Mary fell pregnant around this time, although she herself believed she had actually conceived slightly earlier. By the 19th of October, Mary was back in Edinburgh, only now she had lost the wise political advice of Moray. She was instead surrounded with a new series of advisers, namely Bothwell, Athol Lennox, Huntley and her husband Lord Darnley. None of them had the understanding of statecraft that Moray or William Maitland had, but Moray was now in England, and Maitland was out of favour. All of this was made worse by the fact that Mary was starting to see the true side of her husband, and it had only been a few months since their marriage. Far from being her biggest supporter, he was a violent drunk who reacted badly if he didn't get his own way, and constantly antagonised the lords whose support she needed. 
Mary was quickly disillusioned further when he began to frequent the local brothels on his return, and according to at least one Italian source, he also got a lady of the court pregnant late that year. It wasn't long before the short-lived romance between Mary and Henry quickly fizzled out, and they drifted apart, spending most of their time away from each other. Darnley also got ideas above his station, and began to believe himself now equal to Mary as a possible future king, not merely a consort. He demanded the crown matrimonial, which under Scots law allowed a consort to rule equally as king alongside his wife the queen. Already attempting to disassociate him from her everyday dealings in government, Mary understandably refused to give him this, especially as it would have allowed him to rule in his own stead had she died. Their relationship continued to feel strained, and Darnley began to believe rumours that his unborn child was in fact Rizzio's, and that Rizzio was also the reason he had been refused the crown matrimonial. By March 1566, Darnley had convinced himself of this fact, and that his wife and Rizzio were having an affair. He became involved with the Protestant lords who had rebelled previously against Mary, and between them, they secretly conspired to be rid of David Rizzio. To play devil's advocate, Mary had indeed been spending more time with her private secretary, although that was also understandable. She couldn't trust most of the courtiers who should have been her chief advisors, her husband was fast becoming repulsive, and she must have felt incredibly isolated. Fun and faithful Rizzio was one of her closest friends at that time, and it's not surprising she spent more time with him as a result. There were some sources that suggested Darnley had one night in March gone to Mary's door to find it locked, and after forcing his way in, found Rizzio in only a shirt and robe hiding within. However, Darnley never publicly alleged any of this against either his wife or her secretary, which suggests this is much more likely propaganda against the Scottish Queen. On the 9th of March, Mary was in a small closet of her main chamber at Holyrood Palace. Measuring about 12 by 10 feet, furnished with a table and a small bed, hosting a supper. The guests included Rizzio, her half-sister Jean, Countess of Argyle, Jean's uncle Robert Beaton, Laird of Craik, Lord Robert Stuart, Sir Arthur Erskine of Blackgrange, as well as the Queen's apothecary, a page and a groom. Rizzio's relaxed attitude in Mary's presence was noted by the fact he didn't remove his cap, a gesture that would otherwise be seen as disrespectful. Darnley, by contrast, was busy allowing his fellow conspirators into the palace and they were overpowering the guards. At around six or seven o'clock, as everyone was eating, they were surprised by Darnley appearing from behind a tapestry, having entered from a secret set of stairs. He came and sat beside Mary, putting an arm around her, and then Lord Ruthven appeared, dressed in full armour. They demanded David Rizzio be handed over to them, and Mary refused, asking what offence he had caused in astonishment. Great offence was the answer, and Ruthven declared Rizzio had caused great dishonour to the Queen's character, and he was the reason for Darnley not gaining the crown matrimonial. Rizzio hid behind Mary in a window recess, his dagger drawn as Ruthven ignored Mary's command for him to leave the room or be arrested for treason. Many of those in the room took it as another great offence that Ruthven refused to go, and weapons were drawn on all sides. Six other conspirators burst into the room and a violent fight broke out. The table was overturned and the Countess of Argyle only just managed to save a candle that lit the horrifying scene that ensued. Ruth Venn grabbed the Queen and pushed her into Darnley's arms, telling her to be unafraid, while Darnley calmly held her tightly against her will. She would later say that one of the intruders had threatened her by pointing their gun at her stomach, and one had threatened her with a knife as they reached across for Rizzio, although Ruthven would later deny this. 
Mary would later tell her son James that they were saved only by the actions of Anthony Standen, who moved the blade away from the Queen. Mary would understandably always remain convinced she and her unborn son were meant to be the true victims of the conspiracy. Rizzio apparently grabbed at the Queen's skirt, crying out in Italian, Justice! Justice! Save me, my lady! I am a dying man! Spare my life! Darnley bent back the man's fingers and he was grabbed and dragged through to the chamber beyond. He was stabbed at least a horrendous 56 times and they ensured Darnley's dagger was left in Rizzio's side to proclaim it had been done on the king's orders. However, it's unlikely that Darnley ever actually got a single blow on Rizzio. The private secretary's body was thrown down the main staircase and stripped of its clothing and finery. Mary herself later stated she was in fear of her own life and that of her unborn child, but she was able to speak privately with Darnley after Rizzio was dragged away. She managed to convince him that both of them were in danger, and they escaped the palace at midnight when the guard was relaxed. Darnley realised that he had only been a means to an end, and that the Scottish lords had no intention whatsoever of placing him on the throne. They made it safely to Dunbar Castle, and from there to Edinburgh, where Mary met up with her supporters, although she took up lodgings on the Royal Mile rather than in the castle. It's clear she was unsure who she could trust. On the 21st of March, Mary had her husband declared innocent of Rizzio's murder. She was reconciled with Moray, as well as many of the other lords who had fallen out of favour, and Moray was restored to her council. Mary had also been writing to her cousin Elizabeth, who was shocked and horrified at how Darnley had treated his wife. In April, she wrote a letter asking the English Queen to not allow the fugitive lords to remain in England, and invited Elizabeth to be godmother to her unborn child. Darnley was furious as he hated Elizabeth, and she had never recognised him as King of Scotland, but he was ignored in the interests of his future child and the possibility of them being heir to England's throne. Elizabeth, for her part, was striding about with a miniature figurine of Mary hanging from a gold chain at her waist and declared that if Darnley had been her husband, she would have stabbed him. On the 19th of June, Mary finally gave birth between 9 and 11 a.m. after a painful and long labour of around 20 hours. Her child was a boy, named James after her father, and she declared that he would be the son who would unite Scotland and England. An English envoy, Sir William Stanley, asked her if she meant for the child to be king before his father, and she replied that Darnley had broken with her. Darnley asked sharply if she had not forgotten and forgiven the events in March. Mary answered that she had forgiven, but could never forget. From that moment on, there was no chance of reconciliation between them. During her lying-in period, Darnley went out drinking heavily and causing chaos in the streets of Edinburgh with his friends, and many began to dislike him once more. Mary herself found him a constant thorn in her side. Others reported that he was no longer in favour with her. She began to fear for her son, as even Catherine de' Medici expressed concerns that Darnley was not behaving as he should towards little James. Instead of setting up a separate household for him, as was customary, Mary instead kept her baby son close to her at all times. On top of this, it was reported that Darnley had an intimate friend in Don Francisco de Alava, the Spanish ambassador to the French court, likely because he was trying to cultivate Spanish friendships for his ambitions of gaining the Scottish crown. Mary's terrible judgement of character came to the fore as she increasingly once again found herself unable to know who to trust. She came to lean on the Earl of Bothwell once more, allowing him to manage the bulk of her affairs and conferring gifts on him. She increasingly spent her time away from Darnley, to the point that in July, when she travelled to Stirling alone and Darnley followed her on horseback, she refused him and called him an unwelcome intruder. 
As with other times when she showed too much favour to one courtier, the rumour mill started about herself and Bothwell. In October 1566, while staying at Jedburgh, Mary was noted as having made a journey on horseback of four hours each way to visit Bothwell where he was ill with wounds after a fight. While no suspicions were raised at the time, and she would have been accompanied at all times by her counsellors and guard, this would later be used as evidence she was having an affair with James Hepburn. After returning to Jedburgh, Mary fell seriously ill, with frequent vomiting of blood, fevers, loss of sight and speech convulsions, and she passed in and out of consciousness. She had always been ill during her lifetime, and had often had fainting spells while in France. At one point, it grew so severe she was thought to be dying, and even today the exact nature of her illness is unknown. That perennial favourite when talking of British royal families always comes up, porphyria, or it could have been physical and mental exhaustion, hemorrhage from a stomach ulcer, or even a psychosomatic disorder related to the events of the past year. Many also spoke of poison, and while this is normally the laziest response from the past in relation to someone being sick, it really could have been the case this time, especially as it was reported that while vomiting, Mary brought up a strange green lump very thick and hard. Believing herself she was dying, Mary summoned her counsel and stated that it was her son, not Darnley, who would succeed her, and that Moray would be regent. However, her French physicians were brought in, and by the 24th of October, she started to recover. By early December, Mary was well enough to return to Edinburgh, although her recovery was slow. She met with her advisors at Craigmiller Castle to discuss the Darnley problem, and mainly, divorce was discussed in front of the Queen. However, her only course of action down this route was to use consanguinity of being cousins, especially as the dispensation for this had been acquired only after getting married. But this also risked little James's right to the crown, so it's unlikely Mary would have wanted to do this. It's possible the Lord's present may have come up with another plan on their own, and at least one source suggests there was a discussion that after James's baptism, Darnley would be thrown in prison. It's also possible that the Lords actually wanted to implicate Mary in a plot against Darnley in some way and overthrow her, then raise her son Protestant, which is what actually happened, so it's not that crazy a theory. Later, a bond would apparently be drawn up at Craig Miller, signed by those involved in Darnley's later murder, although it's not known if Mary knew of this. It was certainly, by this point, in her favour to be rid of her husband, and even if she didn't know the details, she suspected something was being planned, as she warned the Lords not to compromise her honour or conscience, but she also couldn't be bothered warning Darnley. But what is important is that sources on both sides suggest the five main nobles, Moray, Maitland, Huntley, Argyll and Bothwell, came up with the idea of bumping Darnley off while at Craigmiller. But on the 17th of December, Mary had other things to think about, as her son James was baptised. She had spared no expense for this event, using her own money to ensure her courtiers were dressed beyond their usual means, their garments made of cloth of gold, silver and tissue. Lord Darnley, by contrast, had much plainer clothes, and Mary apparently had embroidered some details herself on the garments of the Earl of Bothwell. The festivities at the event were designed to impress the many foreign visitors who had been invited, including a mask, fireworks, and a mock battle on a castle by wild men. Afterwards, Mary went to Drummond Castle, and then to Talibardin Castle for New Year, but Darnley headed off to his father's estates in Glasgow, fearing for his life. Shortly after arriving, he was struck with an illness, now thought to be either syphilis, smallpox, or again, poison, although the most likely diagnosis was syphilis according to later investigations to his skull and the treatments he was given at the time. 
This is important, as in the 16th century, the symptoms of syphilis were well known enough for a firm diagnosis of this to be given, and that means Mary would also have likely known the true nature of Darnley's illness, even if it were kept quiet. Whatever the case, he was ill for several weeks, but in January 1567, Mary managed to convince Darnley to return to Edinburgh to recover. There have been suggestions that she did this at the behest of Bothwell, in order to have Darnley assassinated. However, there were several times before this that Mary had flatly refused to consider any plot against her husband. Often, the argument for this hinges on the emotional, that of the very small possibility Mary and Bothwell were having an affair, when in truth, Mary would have been considering the political implications. For both herself and her son, their claims to the English throne were weakened without the presence of Darnley. On the 30th of January, Mary and Darnley arrived in the outskirts of Edinburgh, and they were met by Bothwell, who offered to escort them both to Craig Miller Castle. But still fearing for his life and uncertain who he could trust, Darnley refused, instead stating he wanted to go to a country manor at Kirkerfield. There is proof that hasty arrangements were made for his arrival, so this wasn't planned in any way. There is some confusion over who chose the old provost lodging, however, where he ended up staying. Some sources that were predisposed to be against Mary stated that the Queen chose the lodging. Other sources say that Darnley himself chose the old provost lodging or his brother, or in fact the doctors travelling with them. Yet another source suggests Maitland was behind advising the Queen on where the King should stay, knowing that the house was quiet and easy to approach from the back. However, many of these were written after Darnley's murder, and contemporary accounts mostly agree it was Darnley himself who chose where to stay, so this is most likely. Mary and Darnley spent much of their time together, and we know that by the 7th of February, Henry was improving as he was able to write a private letter to his father. The letter stated that he was on the mend, and that this was mostly down to the efforts of his wife. It spoke of her in loving terms, and it makes clear he had obviously decided against his previous plotting, although there is also the possibility that the letter was invented altogether by the Earl of Lennox who reported on this, especially as he then described Mary as behaving like Judas. That evening, Darnley promised to tell Mary about some information he had that was important to the safety of both their lives, and also that they had to cultivate a trust between them to guard against those who had advised him to apparently take her life. Rumours were fast spreading of a possible attempt on Darnley's life, some saying Bothwell was going to be behind it. One of William Cecil's spies later stated that Lord Robert Stuart, the Queen's half-brother, had come to warn Darnley that if he wasn't moved from his lodgings, it would cost him his life. On the Saturday the 8th, Mary summoned Robert and asked him about what he had said in front of Darnley, Moray and Bothwell but he denied ever saying it. A quarrel then apparently occurred between Darnley and Stuart, and swords were drawn, but it ended peacefully. On the Sunday, the 9th of February, it was the last Sunday in Lent, and as such, Mary had a full day of festivities and duties planned. That morning, Moray came to Mary and asked leave to go home to St Andrews, as his wife was very ill after a miscarriage. It now seems very likely he had knowledge of what was about to happen and was purposely removing himself, especially as he didn't come back immediately once his wife was recovered. Late on Sunday morning, Mary attended the wedding of two of her favourite servants at Holyrood Palace and was the guest of honour at the wedding breakfast. She had also promised the couple she would attend a mask they had arranged in the evening to celebrate their marriage. At 4pm, she attended a banquet in Canongate, accompanied by Bothwell, Argyll and Huntley, who were already dressed in their costumes for the mask. 
Around 7pm, Mary, who was herself dressed in a mask already, left with many of the lords who had attended her and went to spend the evening with her husband. While Mary chatted and kissed Darnley, those who had come with her, namely Bothwell, Argyll and Huntley, played dice with a member of her privy council, who also happened to be a Catholic, Gilbert Kennedy, the Earl of Cassilis. There is again some conflicting reports over when they left, but it was likely between 10pm and midnight, with Mary and her courtiers stating they left around midnight. When Mary left, Darnley made it clear that he expected her to return and spend the night with him. However, Bothwell reminded the Queen that in the morning she had arranged to ride to Seton, and therefore it would be better for her to sleep at Holyrood Palace. Maitland also agreed with her leaving the lodgings, and this has often puzzled historians who suspect he wanted to do away with the Queen as well. Although, this perhaps shows that if the Lords did indeed plan Darnley's murder, they didn't actually want to kill off Mary as well. Moray had only ever shown that he wanted her removed from the throne, not actually executed. Mary attempted to assure Darnley she would be with him the following day, and she gave him a ring as a token of this promise. As Mary mounted her horse in the courtyard, she saw Nicholas Hubert, who was known as Paris, and noted loudly to her surprise that his face was dirty. She would later realise it was possibly gunpowder. He said nothing, and as she rode away, she noted that his face had gone red. Over at Kirkerfield, Darnley got ready for bed and talked to his servants before going to sleep around 1am. An hour later, around 2am, the town was shook by a massive explosion. Some people would later declare they had seen guards running through the darkness just moments before the explosion, and it was followed by the townsfolk waking up suddenly, the air filled with the sound of confusion and fearful cries. The entirety of where Darnley had been staying was blown up from its very foundations, so much so that the neighbouring houses were shaken as well. The Privy Council would later decide it had been blown apart by a large quantity of gunpowder, and that it was so explosive that nothing remained of the rooms within the house except powder. Two women, known as Mrs. Merton and Mrs. Mary Sterling, both said they saw around 11 men running out of Blackfriars Gate after the explosion, and that Mrs. Merton shouted they were traitors up to some evil deed, and tried to stop one of them to ask what had happened. The two women were ignored, and they watched the men split into two groups and disappear in different directions. This makes it clear this was an organised explosion, sorted by someone who had men under their command and the resources to make it happen. Mary had been awoken at Holyrood with the explosion, and believing it to be cannon fire, had sent messengers out. When it became clear what had happened, Bothwell was given the news as he was Sheriff of Edinburgh, and therefore in charge of investigating crimes. He immediately sent off his men to find out what had become of the king and went back to bed to await news. Members of the Night Watch came across Captain William Blackadder, one of Bothwell's men, and promptly arrested him as they thought it was rather suspicious he was there. He protested he had been drinking with a friend nearby, but they arrested him anyway. There is no evidence he was part of the conspiracy, so his story might be true. Around the collapsed lodgings of the king, people rescued his servant, Thomas Nelson, who had been thrown clear of the blast and was precariously balanced on a wall. They then set to digging through the heaps of ash and stone, hampered by the winter snow and the darkness, knowing that the king was probably in there somewhere. Some of the servants were found in the rubble, but it wasn't until 5am that anyone thought to look in the south garden of the property, where they found the bodies of Darnley and his valet, Taylor, both wearing short nightshirts and without a single mark on them. Everyone was perplexed as to how the two men had apparently died. Unlike the other poor mutilated bodies of the servants that had been found in the rubble, Darnley and Taylor had no burn marks or marks from being thrown, but also no signs of strangulation, violence or fractures. Near the bodies was a chair, a length of rope, a dagger, 
Darnley's fur-trimmed nightgown and a quilt. Unlike the bodies, the quilt and nightgown were covered with powder and had burn marks, and many present at the scene decided the items looked as though they had been placed by hand, rather than blown there, although this could have been hindsight with what came later. Soon after, the Queen was given the news, and she retired to her chamber in deep grief, remaining in there for the remainder of the day. Bothwell was apparently deeply distressed as well, dressing quickly and racing to Mary's side, along with Argyle, Athol, Maitland, and the Countesses of Athol and Mar to comfort her. One of William Cecil's spies arrived at the scene and immediately drew a sketch, which survives to this day. People across Edinburgh were unsettled by Darnley's death, and rumours flew thick and fast. Back at Holyrood, Mary adopted the French custom of mourning, ordering Black Serge to make a full mourning gown, remaining in seclusion for 40 days within her chambers, with no light allowed to penetrate. It wasn't long after that an autopsy was ordered for Darnley's body, and far from the initial assumption that his body was untouched, he was actually found to have a broken rib and several internal injuries, most likely from being thrown by the blast. The first official report of the event happened quickly after this, as the Privy Council recognised the need to prevent a scandal, and they wrote a letter first to Catherine de' Medici. They wrote that they assumed whoever had killed Darnley had also planned to bump off Mary, and that they had already started an inquiry. A further letter sent on the 11th of February, apparently written by Mary but in Scots, a language she did not normally write in, suggesting it was written on her behalf as she dictated, perhaps too distressed to write herself, contained this passage. By whom it has been done, or in what manner, it appears not yet. We doubt not, but, according to the vigilance our council has begun to already use, the certainty of all shall be used shortly, and, the same being discovered, which we know God will never suffer to lie hidden, we hope to punish the same with such rigour as serve for an example of this cruelty to all ages to come. If Mary really had any part in the murder, she was playing the part of a vengeful queen to perfection. It's far more likely this is not a ploy, and that Mary's vehement language is in fact indicative of what she really felt. She went on to also show that she felt the explosion had clearly also been meant to kill her as well as Darnley, and this adds a completely different dimension to events. However, to this day, there is no certainty over who killed Darnley. It was certainly a planned murder, and judging by the many eyewitness reports of armed men wandering around just shortly before and after the explosion, and the motive of removing Darnley in the first place, and possibly Mary herself, this was an attack carried out by someone high in government who had the power and the means to do this without leaving much of a trace. There is a wealth of contemporary evidence from the time, but most of it was collected behind closed doors or after the events, or from unreliable witnesses, making it all very difficult to formulate into a conclusion that doesn't have bias. Many became suspects, including Bothwell, Moray Maitland, the Earl of Morton, and Mary herself. Elizabeth wrote to her cousin, remarking that, Men say that instead of seizing the murderers, you are looking through your fingers while they escape. She suggested Mary was not doing enough to find the murderer or murderers of her husband, while vehemently denying she had any thoughts of Mary being the killer. She was also giving her sound advice, as if Mary wasn't seen to be doing enough to avenge the death of the Scottish king, her own subjects might see fit to depose her. It was Bothwell who emerged as the most likely suspect, however. Due to his closeness to the Queen, he had a strong motive to remove Darnley, especially as the Queen had been rejecting her husband for some time. Bothwell had grown in power over the past few months, had the means to carry the explosion out, 
and according to some depositions, had carried powder kegs to the lodgings with his men hours before the blast. However, interestingly, Bothwell himself also wrote to Mary and agreed to undergo a trial, which suggests either an innocent man or possibly one who was very certain of having covered his tracks well. Mary also comes under strong suspicion. While much of her actions do point at a woman who was in shock, she also had made no effort to hide that she wanted rid of Darnley. She was close to Bothwell and may well have been having an affair with him, although there is no contemporary evidence of this. She had removed Darnley from his father's stronghold at Glasgow and taken him to Edinburgh, where many of his enemies were, and she herself had allowed the return of many of those men from exile just a few months prior. Certainly, later she had no qualms about telling Anthony Babington she was fine with Queen Elizabeth being assassinated in order to claim the English throne. Why would her estranged husband be a problem? On the other hand, she had also made it clear at all times with her advisors that she did not wish Darnley dead, but that she wanted a legal way to be rid of him. She had also thought he was plotting against her and her son, and so had removed him from Glasgow from near the Clyde where ships could come in. However, none of the evidence given actually pointed a firm finger at Bothwell, but what he did afterwards says a lot about the possibility of him being the killer. The Earl of Lennox, Darnley's father, accused Bothwell publicly and asked Mary to put him on trial. She agreed, and the Privy Council began proceedings on the 12th of April. Mary had actually met all of Lennox's requests leading up to the trial, and again, it's highly unlikely she would have agreed to such a public ordeal had there been any chance of her being found guilty. However, unfairness soon crept through. On the 10th of April, a few days before, Lennox had apparently tried to enter Edinburgh with 3,000 men, only to be told he could only take six with him according to the law. This was true and the accused could only bring four. However, Bothwell had apparently turned up with 4,000 men and instead of reprimanding him, Mary did nothing. There is some evidence to show along with this that Mary might have been quite intimidated by him. As a result, Lennox didn't dare enter Edinburgh in case he was killed and he fell back to Stirling. He wrote to Mary to ask that the trial be postponed and that he might have sufficient time to find evidence. However, as he had already been pushy in demanding an early trial and was now complaining about it, his request was ignored. Bothwell's trial lasted from 10am to 7pm and he was acquitted. A week later on the 19th, he held a supper for the Lords from Parliament and made it clear he had plans to marry the Queen. Now, aside from this being a total surprise after the events of the previous week, Bothwell was technically still married to his first wife, Jean Gordon. Her brother was an ally of Bothwell's and he convinced his sister to start divorce proceedings against her husband around that time. The Lords signed the Ainsley Tavern Bond in which they agreed to support Bothwell marrying Mary. It's possible he either got them drunk or bribed them or both. He hadn't actually asked Mary at this point, nor was his marriage annulled until the 7th of May. By then, however, Mary was already under his control. She visited her son James for what would be the last time at Stirling Castle between the 21st and the 23rd of April, and rumours afterwards would suggest that she planned to put him into the care of Bothwell. Again, there is no contemporary evidence to support this, and after the precautions she had taken to protect her son so far, and how much she was keen to show her affection for him, it is completely ridiculous that she would have risked him being killed by Bothwell. All sources stating this story came from much later, when Mary's name was fast being ruined by rumours. On her return to Edinburgh on the 24th, she was apprehended on the road by Bothwell and 800 of his men. He told her that certain danger awaited in the city in the form of a riot, and for her own protection, 
he wished to convey her to his castle at Dunbar for safety. Mary agreed to go with him, but once there, was taken prisoner. At his castle, Mary was then allegedly raped by Bothwell in an effort to secure marriage to her, as now there was a chance she could be pregnant. Whether or not she was a victim of her abduction or a willing participant quickly became a topic of conversation amongst many, not helped by the rumours previously that she had been having an affair with him. Going by the fact she didn't feel she could stand up to him during his trial and how much power Bothwell had by this point, there is an argument to be made that Mary was intimidated and completely controlled by him. We have no evidence as to what actually happened. For all we know, it's even possible he threatened the life of her son James if she didn't marry him. On top of this, a letter she wrote after these events to the Bishop of Dunblane makes it clear that she felt somewhat broken by what was happening, as she was well aware that holding on to the reins of her country was becoming an impossible task without a man by her side, at least how it would have been viewed by her subjects. She was wearied by all that had happened recently, and Bothwell appeared to be competent, capable of running government, and wasn't a foreign consort which she knew her subjects would not accept at that time. Mary was also well aware that for the sake of her own honour, as well as that of Bothwell, she could not openly accuse him of rape. Unfortunately, while Mary was left with little choice but to marry him, and she even had good reasons for doing so, many still thought of Bothwell as the most likely murderer of Darnley, and in marrying him, she brought herself under suspicion once more. The marriage would be tempestuous and unhappy, and eventually the lords would rise up once again against Mary and Bothwell. The marriage angered everyone. Catholics especially wouldn't accept the marriage because they saw Bothwell's annulment as unlawful, and because his marriage to Mary had been under Protestant rites. Bothwell eventually fled to Denmark where he would go insane and die, and Mary was arrested. She miscarried twins between the 20th and 23rd of July 1567, not only a sad event for her as their mother, but it might also have changed events had they lived. She was forced to abdicate in favour of her infant son, which of course allowed many of her courtiers to once again take power for themselves. Mary would eventually escape to England, throwing herself on the mercy of her cousin Elizabeth and hoping for aid to reclaim her throne, although this aid never materialised. Eventually, Mary would grow weary of being treated as a prisoner for around 19 years, and she would relent to agreeing to a plot to assassinate Elizabeth. Sadly for Mary, the plot was being closely watched and she was discovered by Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's spymaster, and Elizabeth had little choice but to condemn the Scottish Queen to death. Mary would be executed by beheading on the 8th of February 1587 at Fotheringay Castle in the Great Hall, wearing a crimson gown, the colour of martyrdom in Catholicism. All of her belongings and anything that had a drop of her blood on were burned in the great fire of the hall to prevent relics being made of them. Elizabeth would later claim she had not ordered the death of Mary at all, but it was clear she indeed had a hand in events while ensuring she wasn't directly blamed for them. But the death of the Queen of Scots triggered Catholics across Europe to centre in on Elizabeth. Mary's death was not a direct trigger for Spain choosing to attack England, but it was one of the main reasons. Much of Mary's part in events leading up to Darnley's death and shortly afterwards were out of her hands. She was a strong queen, much like Elizabeth, but unlike her cousin, she was not a good judge of character. Mary put her faith in the wrong men, surrounded herself with advisers who wanted power for themselves at the expense of her own, and ultimately was a lonely figure who became a tragic one in lieu of her decisions. She was clever and well-educated in statecraft, but she leaned too much on her counsel, 
and showed favoritism to a degree that made others jealous. These factors would all play into Mary's place in people's minds after Darnley's death. It seems highly unlikely she actually had a part in his murder. At every point, she seems to have dissuaded those around her from harming him physically, instead wishing to have him removed in a way that did not affect her conscience or honor. She allowed a trial and wrote letters that absolutely suggest her innocence, because the exposure through these would have turned up something if Mary had been involved. She was hampered in pursuing the murderers by a privy council who knew it was in their favour if Mary was seen to be incompetent at the reins of government. In essence, it's highly unlikely Mary had a hand in the murder of Lord Darnley or even had knowledge of it. We can never be completely certain as the evidence for the crime is so muddied by speculation, rumour and bias that it is an impossible task beyond conjecture but it's far more likely Mary was a tragic queen who never really had the opportunity to stamp her own authority on her kingdom due to those around her having an invested interest in her failure. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.